Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church's YouTube worship service for the third Sunday of Lent, March 7th, 2021. A couple announcements I'd like to highlight before we begin our service of worship. Thank you to all those who participated in yesterday's workday here at the church. We also continue to collect items from the pantry on Wednesdays from 5 to 6 p.m. at 25 Knight Avenue. If you would like to donate food and are able to make it at that appointed time, you may contact the church office to set up a drop-off. Our next pantry day is Thursday, March 11th from 9 to 10 in the morning and then from 6 to 7 in the evening. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins unto God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, his mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in the covenant of grace, and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in anything in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbors. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm number 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run his course. It does, goes forth from the utterage edge, uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter than honey, than honey in the comb. 
By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. You can detect one's own offenses. Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Here ends the psalm. Now we have special music by Pastor Jack Slaughterback. Jesus took the nails. Our second reading is from St. Paul's first letter of the Church of Corinth. For the message from the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the sermon of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, 
but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their table. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This week we reach the halfway point through Lent. Holy Week and Good Friday are looming. And as we turn our thoughts toward the crucifixion, we ponder again the great sacrifice made by Jesus on the cross. Good Friday is a day of deep pain and deep theological meaning. Maybe the reason so many want to bypass Good Friday is a disturbing, painful image of the cross. Maybe we can overlook the physical pain and mental anxiety of such a cruel death, but all of us must at some time or other deal with the deepest emotional pain that Jesus experiences on the cross. Complete and total abandonment. Oh, there were people there, so Jesus wasn't physically alone. There were those there who mocked him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah. There were the Roman soldiers tasked the duty of crucifying him, who would divide his clothes later after his death, and cast lots for them. And there are those who just came to see the spectacle of it. But the disciples were nowhere to be found. Peter, James, and John, who were the inner circle that often spent time alone with him, were gone hiding, hoping they would not be next. Jesus even may have felt abandoned by God as we hear him scream, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And that is the real problem with the crucifixion for us. We will never know the pain of being nailed to a cross and dying there of a painful, horrible death. But all of us, no matter how loved we are, have felt some sort of abandonment in our lives. Monophobia is the fear of being alone. And all of us at some point have felt that fear and know that we may face it again and in some future time. When Jesus cries, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can relate. Our problem with Good Friday is the fact that we have to experience the Messiah, the Son of God's total abandonment. And if Jesus could be subject to such anguish, so can we. We don't want to be alone. The people of ancient civilizations were also fearful of being alone in a wild and unpredictable world. These men and women created a host of gods who could be safely located in available shrines and temples. It was important that these gods have both faces and voices. Temples were decorated with elaborate statuary and pictures of what the god looked like. Oracles spoke the god's message to those who paid the right price or carried the right favor. It is hard for us today to realize just how radical Israel's call to monotheism was. Its rejections of idols was scandalous in the ancient world. Scholars have too easily interpreted temple sacrifices and the mysterious surroundings of the Ark of the Covenant within a backdrop of ancient, mystical, Near Eastern religions without fully appreciating this radical disjunction. Although worship at the Ark and the temple were ringed with ritual, there was a profound difference. In the heart of the Jerusalem temple, and in the heart of that temple, within its innermost sanctuary, was the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest was allowed to visit. In the heart of the Holy of Holies, separated by partitions and curtains, sat the ark itself. In the heart of the ark was the throne, or mercy seat. The kippurath, or mercy seat, 
was a slab of gold resting on top of the ark. Guarding either end of the slab and of one piece with it were the golden cherubim, their faces turned inward toward each other, and their wings arched over the mercy seat. Here between the cherubim and, and over the mercy seat was the throne, the dwelling of the God of Israel. On the Day of Atonement it was on this mercy seat that the high priest sprinkled sacrificial blood. The cherubim did not reside on the mercy seat. God's presence was nowhere portrayed within this Holy of Holies or anywhere else within the temple. All that greeted the high priest was a blank slab of open space, a void, the great speaking absence between the images. In other words, the most sacred space where God was in the midst of the Hebrew people was empty. What the Israelites carried with them through the wilderness and protected with their lives was a seat with nothing on it, but to them everything in it. To go to Jerusalem to visit God, to make a pilgrimage to find mercy and comfort, was to visit empty space, the holy absence and holy silence of the holy space between those cherubim. It is exactly because there was no gilded statue or talking idol that the Israelites were able to experience the living presence of God's holiness in their midst. Jesus' rampage in the temple was partly a reaction against the intrusions of the unholy noise and unholy images into the sanctuary of holy silence. Jesus saw that the temple site was gradually being transformed from a center of spirituality that leads one to greater silence and greater space for holiness into a place simply of greater hustle and bustle. The crush of crowds and commerce threatened to fill in the cracks of the holy absences. By cleansing the temple of all this noise pollution, Jesus sought to restore the purity of the temple. Only by regaining the sanctity of silence and the silence of the sanctuary could the Jews hope to hear the speaking absence in their presence. Are we afraid to listen for God's speaking absence in our own lives? What kind of noise have we let into our temples in order to avoid listening to that speaking absence? What imagines of God are preventing us from finding the mercy seat of help and healing? In our churches, do we let committee meetings, budget crunches, and church school attendance drown out the speaking absences? In our families, do we let busy schedules, old feuds, and bad habits drown out their speaking absences? In our work, do we let concerns about getting ahead, being left behind, and making the cut drawn, making the cut drown out those speaking absences? In our schools, do we let peer pressure, insecurity, and cowardice drown out the speaking absences? In our communities, do we let fear, prejudice, and despair drown out the speaking absences? When Jesus himself became the new temple, the new mercy seat for God's presence, he made it possible for each one of us to become temples. Jesus became a holy place that we might each become a holy place. Jesus became the new mercy seat that we might each become a mercy seat. By taking God's holy of holies out of stone temples and bringing it into the center of his own life, Jesus made the encounter of the divine presence possible for all people. The body of Christ became the Christ body community for all the generations of the church. In the words of the Anglican Bishop Rowan Williams, Jesus is our holy place, which also means that he is the promise of a new kind of holiness. Here is a life in which the detail, either the triviality of a human story becomes the word and name of God to us, so that we know that the contours of human history can be the presence of God. If we are drawn into the words and acts and passion of Jesus that, as St. Paul said, his life and death are at the work in us, we become sanctuaries to each other, holy places, mercy seats. Until that time, we live between the old Jerusalem and the new. Again, William says, it is in the life and death of the Lamb of God that we silence, that the silence culminates. It is in his life and death that we know there is no more need for a mercy seat, and at last the silence not between the cherubim, but between two thieves, and an absence between two white-clad figures in a burial vault. Are our lives silent enough to hear the speaking absence? Have we found the empty space of God's presence in the holy temple of our lives, in the empty grave of Jesus? Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now we have special music from Bob Kramer and Harry Ravel, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. That the whole church on earth would be united in its love for the commands of God and its embrace of the whole creation. That the wisdom of the world will be overtaken by God's foolishness and that human strength will be overshadowed by God's weakness. For our congregation, that we will genuinely reflect upon ourselves and our faith during the season of Lent, that we may be prepared to eagerly celebrate the joy and new life of resurrection at Easter. For peace in our troubled world, Bring an end to violence and bloodshed. Teach us to truly respect life and to find amicable ways to resolve our differences. For all who stand strong in their faith and are martyred by their power and be their power and hope, comfort those whose loved ones have paid the price for bearing witness to Christ in the world. God of compassion, come to the aid of those in need, especially the unemployed and those who seek meaningful work, so that all might serve you in their vocations. Give strength and healing to all those who have the coronavirus. Drive out the virus and heal all parts of the body that have been affected. Guide and protect doctors, nurses, and all hospital staff as they treat the infected. Comfort the dying and those who stand by them. Give life to those who are working with the public, to go for employees, delivery people, gas station attendants, cashiers, and store clerks, utility workers, police officers, postal employees, waiters and waitresses. Strengthen and protect them as they continue to provide essential services to us. Give continued guidance with President Biden and his advisors during these difficult times. We continue to pray for the safety of troops who are deployed throughout the world, especially for those who are known to us, Andre Flamini and Jordan Wilson. Hear our prayer for all the sick. Embrace them with your arms of comfort and healing. We especially ask your healing power on those who are close to us, as we now name them in our hearts and out loud. Lord, we pray for anyone having problems with their bones or blood. In the name of Jesus, I come against the root and cells that are affected, commanding every cancer cell to die and the bone marrow to produce pure, healthy blood. Lord, restore the affected organs and tissues and multiply the defense of good cells to overcome all the problem cells and areas. We pray and thank you for the faithful departed, for, the, for whose lives continue to bear witness to the light of Christ, in which we now abide eternally. This morning, we remember the life and witness of Lynn Maynard, Pearl Cox, Kathy Daly, Herb Lunn, Barbara and Donald Hobbs, Annette Reed, and Margaret Reichert. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who told us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.